Welcome. Thank you all for coming. I'm Tina Tinkarosanitza, Dean of the School of International Relations at Pilisi Free University. And let me welcome our distinguished guests, professors from Stanford University, John Kopisk University in Kakabeduitze campus. And our discussion is going to be about the global fight for democracy in Georgia. Let me mention that this discussion is in the frame of the program organized by the Stanford University, EPRC, and this year with the partnership of Free University. It's called Leadership Academy for Development. And I had the privilege and honor to be the first cohort member of this program. And let me mention that this is one of the most fruitful, amazing, and interesting program I participate in. Thank you very much for this. And let me um, take some brief about our speakers. Mr. Professor Francis Fukuyama, Senior Fellow, Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, Stanford University will be our speaker. Professor um, Eric Jensen, director of the Rule of, sorry, Rule of Law program at Stanford Law School. Professor Roger Leeds, John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, size. So floor is yours, gentlemen. So let's talk about democracy, the challenges of democracy and place of Georgia in this modern world. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, let me uh, begin. So thank you very much for coming tonight. It's a great pleasure. Uh, I sat in this very spot, uh, I think maybe five years ago or so, Eric uh, did also. And it's great to see another generation of students uh, at the Free University. Uh, so congratulations for being here and for being a beacon of academic freedom uh, in Georgia. Uh, I think that you know, we've been spending time talking about the crisis that this region is in uh, as a result of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, also the crisis that's going on domestically here uh, in Georgia and the way that Georgian democracy has evolved. Uh, I want to, well, let, okay, so let me just begin by saying that I do think that the fight that's going on in Ukraine is really the central struggle over democracy anywhere in the world right now. And, uh, you know, we at Stanford have been very supportive of the Ukrainian struggle. Uh, we've invited a lot of Ukrainians to Stanford. We've done a lot of programs with young Ukrainian leaders, and many of them are heavily, heavily involved in, uh, in that fight. And it matters a great deal, I think, both to the region and the world, uh, whether Russia wins or loses. And I strongly believe that they're going to lose. Uh, and I actually think that they're going to lose by this summer. Uh, and uh, we, we can talk about that, but I don't actually want to start with that topic because I think that probably everybody in this room is quite familiar with that struggle and its importance. It obviously has big repercussions for your democracy uh, here in Georgia, but I just wanted to talk about the broader geopolitical context uh, and a topic that you might not spend as much time discussing, which is the other big authoritarian uh, country in the world, which is China. Uh, because in the long run, I think most people, and certainly the Biden administration in Washington, uh, thinks that China is going to be, in the long run, the bigger threat to global democracy than Russia will be. Uh, and that you know, the reasons for that are pretty obvious, that China is much bigger uh, as a global power. It has a GDP that's several times the size of Russia. It is leading in many uh, very advanced technologies. Of course, it has a huge population. Uh, and any rising power in the world uh, is destabilizing. And as you've probably seen, there's been this steady deterioration of relations between uh, China and the United States. Uh, in my opinion, this deterioration is really not due to uh, the United States. It's really due to the changes that have occurred in China since uh, Xi Jinping's rise to power in 2013. Uh, under his rule, China has become uh, an increasingly centralized dictatorship. A similar thing has been going on in Russia, obviously under Putin as well, but in the case of Xi Jinping, he's dismantled 
most of the collective leadership structures that had been put in place after 1978. Power is really not shared with anybody else in the uh, Chinese Standing Committee of the Politburo uh, and really is concentrated in uh, this one individual. Uh, Chinese people have lost a lot of the freedom that they had uh, under previous communist uh, 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 administrations after 1978. The economy uh, is not doing well, actually. Uh, and I think it's not doing well because one of the things that Xi Jinping has wanted to do is to re-centralize the state's control over the economy. So he has deliberately gone after people like Jack Ma of Alibaba, these other big tech entrepreneurs in China, because I don't think he can tolerate uh, very rich people that have an independent power base that's not connected to the uh, Communist Party. But in the process, he's hobbling the Chinese economy's entrepreneurial spirit, and the Chinese are really good entrepreneurs. Uh, and so in a sense, it's a self-defeating project. By the way, um, there are big problems elsewhere in the Chinese economy because they have grossly overinvested in real estate, in construction, uh, in infrastructure. And so they've got really great hospital, uh, I'm sorry, they've got great airports, highways, high-speed rail, but very inadequate hospitals, uh, you know, a poor social safety net. And as you're probably aware, their population has now uh, begun to decline in absolute terms because they've hit a demographic transition and they're going to grow smaller pretty fast, uh, faster than other Asian countries that, like Japan and South Korea and Taiwan that are going through something similar. Uh, I think that the issue that everybody in Washington has been really concerned about uh, is Taiwan, uh, because after the Russian invasion, uh, all of a sudden people could see in their imaginations what a military action would look like. Uh, and they figured that if Russia could do something as reckless as invade uh, its neighboring country, a country of 40 million people, that China could do the same thing with regard to Taiwan, which it regards uh, as a breakaway province. And I think that uh, if you look at the, you know, the evolution of the Chinese military over the last 40 years, it really has a single purpose, and that purpose is to retake uh, Taiwan if they uh, wanted to do that. Uh, and it's been the fastest growing military of any uh, militaries in the world over the last decade. Uh, so they've added a lot of capability, and I think that uh, now there is a lot of fear that this is something Xi Jinping may want to do before he steps down. He just reappointed himself to have a, a third five-year term, uh, and reuniting China is something that he's pretty clearly stated uh, as a goal. Uh, we actually just sent it. I was on a delegation from our institute. Uh, we went to Japan because, like Germany, Japan is really scared by this, and they've decided to double their defense budget, uh, just like the German Zeitenwende uh, in response to the Ukraine invasion. Uh, and so we can we can talk about you know what the likelihood of such a occurrence is, but I'm afraid that the geopolitical threats to free societies doesn't end with Ukraine. I think that we've got a really big problem in the Far East, and because of China's size and global weight, um, I think that you know that uh, is going to be a longer lasting and more difficult uh, challenge than the one um, uh, that's offered by Russia. Uh, so the other topic that probably we could talk about usefully that you have not discussed endlessly is American politics, because um, unfortunately American democracy has not been a great model for global democracy in recent years with the rise of uh, Donald Trump and the kind of populist nationalism that he represents. Uh, I'm you know, as you're probably aware, he's agreed to, or he's announced that he's going to run for president uh, once more in 2024. Uh, his entire campaign seems to be built around grievance, uh, his belief that 
The last election was stolen from him. Uh, and, um, you know, he has now tried to persuade his followers, who are maybe a third of American voters, that uh, America itself is deeply corrupt because they could deprive him uh, of another term as, uh, as president. And so our politics is not very um, inspiring at the present moment. Um, maybe just introducing those two topics, uh, I, uh, I will turn the floor over to my colleagues who can talk about other issues and we can return to Ukraine, China, and what's going on in the United States uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as you wish the discussion to proceed. So with that, go ahead, Eric. Okay. Okay. So I, uh, I will talk a little bit about the rule of law. Uh, first, I'll zoom out and uh, look at the rule of law recession that we find ourselves globally in. And uh, then I'll zoom in and um, perhaps not provide any unique insight into what is happening in, in Georgia, but uh, there are certainly views about uh, what is happening in the judiciary in Georgia, and I'll uh, synthesize some of those views. So zooming out, the uh, rule of law recession uh, pretty much started with the democracy recession, which started when, Frank? 2008. 2008. Um, and... Uh, Rule of law is sort of the, the rules of the game for uh, societies. So uh, democracy really depends on, on the bedrock of rule of law. Uh, now, there, so where, where does the U.S. stand in the rule of law recession? In uh, 2020, uh, for the first time, uh, the U.S. Fought, fell out of the, the top 20 countries in, in the world. And uh, that's by uh, the World Justice Project has reported that. And the World Justice Project has been reporting on and measuring a decline in rule of law in Georgia since 2015. Uh, so that's, that's a bit of context. Uh, there are reasons uh, why uh, uh, judiciaries have become uh, sort of central institutions to co-op by autocrats. Um, in, uh, in 1946, uh, judicial review was embedded in constitutions and only 20-some percent of constitutions. And today, well over 80% of constitutions uh, include judicial review. That is the capacity of uh, judiciaries to uh, review the acts of parliament and review the acts of uh, the executive. So um, that sort of power has attracted autocrats, and autocrats have sought to uh, control and co-opt judiciaries through different uh, means, uh, uh, figuring out ways to uh, distort the, the membership on judiciaries to, to undermine uh, their, their independence. So that's, uh, that's a bit of the zoom out context. There's also Something that always troubles me is that I think in rule of law, the most difficult thing to achieve is equality under the law, that everyone is treated equally. 97% of constitutions in the world include uh, uh, equal protection clause in their constitutions. And yet when we look around the world, uh, we certainly don't see equality breaking out uh, everywhere. Uh, Georgia's constitution also has an equal protection uh, clause. Now, of course, you're aware of different recent events, such as the State Department sanctioning four judges, uh, uh, four Georgian judges, which, frankly, I'm trying to recall a time in U.S. history where that's, that's happened. That is an extraordinarily bold and unambiguous statement by the State Department uh, about the condition of the judiciary uh, in Georgia. Um, there are reports, I, I've read probably 1,500 pages of, of uh, consulting reports and reform reports from different agencies uh, upon arriving in Georgia some days ago. And uh, the stories about a, a, a clan of judges operating and controlling the uh, judiciary. I'm not going to comment in any detail on it, but if those allegations are true, it's truly disturbing. And that allegation came up in report after report from agencies who don't necessarily 
uh, agree with each other. So uh, where to go from here? Um, judiciaries are hard to reform, uh, and I, I don't have a specific uh, prescription, but Georgia certainly has the imperative. Uh, who would have thought that Georgia, when Frank and I were here six years ago, Georgia was leading the, the, the pack of uh, those in the region who were seeking uh, EU um, uh, accession. Um, and uh, now uh, Georgia finds itself in third place behind uh, Ukraine and Moldova, of all places, Moldova, really. Uh, I, I love Moldova, but it's at a, an entirely different level of development, uh, and certainly uh, Georgia should be, uh, should be faring better. So I, um, I guess I'll leave it at, uh, leave it at that. I, I hope for the future of Georgia, always uh, supportive. Um, you can tell by my forehead, I have fell for Georgia last night, and I've fallen for Georgia uh, many times in, in the past, and I'll continue to fall for Georgia. I think they're extraordinarily encouraging things uh, in this scene of political polarization in Georgia, as we have in the U.S. Uh, Georgia has a motivation uh, to uh, accede to the uh, European Union, and recent polls, it's 89% of Georgians uh, want uh, EU membership. That's an incredibly encouraging and potentially unifying. Uh, the EU just uh, recently came out, instead of uh, offering uh, Georgia what it offered uh, Ukraine and Moldova, it offered 12 recommendations to, uh, to, to Georgia. The third recommendation relates unambiguously to judicial reform. So there, there should be a unifying, motivating factor yeah, in, in the country to do so. So first of all, let me say how absolutely wonderful it is to be in Georgia. Uh, we've been here all week. Uh, each time we come to Georgia, we are more impressed by the caliber of the people we work with. This week, we're uh, running a course for about 35 uh, individuals, predominantly Georgians. And every night, we finish our day of teaching, and we talk to each other, and we say how extraordinarily impressed we are by the caliber of the people in our program. So first of all, we're very, very pleased to be here, and we're very impressed by what we see in the, amongst the, the young Georgians that we're working with. It's been a great privilege. Uh, just to put this in context, on, the right, on my right, you have a political scientist. On the left, you have a lawyer. And I, unfortunately, am only an economist. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a third-class citizen compared to my distinguished colleagues I've here. never heard such humility from an economist. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to pick up on a couple of things that uh, Professor Fukuyama said about China, because uh, rather than talk about Russia, um, the other thing that we don't remember about, well, we re may remember about China, it, no country in the history of the world has developed over such a short period of time so rapidly as China. We have to keep that, we have to acknowledge that. When you go back to uh, when Mao Zedong died in 1976, and then there was a succession of, uh, of leaders starting with Deng Xiaoping in 1978, uh, I'm not going to give you a, a history lesson on China, but I, my, most of my work and time is spent in developing countries and trying to figure out how countries can make the leap from being underdeveloped to middle income and then to the high income. And China is in a class by itself. And no matter what we, can, we say today about uh, what we believe about China today and, and, and the, what we think about Xi Jinping, the current uh, head of China, we have to acknowledge that this country has just done an extraordinary job of developing its country. In 1976, when uh, Mao Zedong died, uh, it was one of the poorest countries in the world, if not the poorest. It was completely isolated from the world. Today, the, it's very difficult to believe the data, but China has a, uh, a middle class with a lot of disposable income of something like 400 million people, more than the population of the United States. So this has been an extraordinary journey that they've made. I think that uh, my colleague is right that the, the economy has slowed down and they've got a lot of economic problems right now. But take, keeping that in mind, you cannot 
forget that the country has come a very long way and uh, they have done an extraordinary job in, in many different ways. I just wanted to make that point. The other point, as someone who works all over the developing world, uh, when I, just a very few years ago, um, whenever you talked about financing of development, financing of infrastructure, financing of education, anywhere in the world, you look to the World Bank and the other Western-dominated uh, development, we, we call the development finance institutions. That would be the European Bank for Development or uh, a, a number of other development finance institutions, which were predominant, which were started after World War II, which were not, not EBRD, but the others, but that have really dominated the financing of development projects throughout the developing world. And then about 10 years ago, uh, there started to be a shift. And today, it's an extraordinary statement that China, through this program it calls euphemistically the Belt Road Initiative, it finances more infrastructure in different countries around the developing world than the World Bank, almost a trillion dollars. When I say trillion, it's a number I can't quite, I can't quite grasp. That. Actually, it's three times the size of all of the other development banks combined. And it didn't, and, and it was doing nothing 10 or 12 years ago. So this has been a meteoric rise uh, uh, of China as a major factor in development finance. And they're not doing it just because they're nice people. They have strategic interest in, in financing all this infrastructure around the world. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that if you're interested, but it's an extraordinary story that they are, they are now much larger in terms of their financing than the development finance institutions. And we didn't even think about them 10 years ago. So this is quite, quite extraordinary. I'm not saying it's all good. They've made huge uh, missteps, mistakes, uh, there's been a tremendous backlash against Chinese financing, but again, it, it gives you some sense that China is um, a major player on the international stage, much, 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 much more than Russia, uh, not to minimize Russia, but so it, it is something that we have to keep an eye on. Uh, and what's happening in China, of course, is in some respects is very discouraging, but it, it deserves our attention and to some extent what has achieved our respect. Uh, I think we came here this afternoon mainly to hear from you. Uh, we've heard that the Free University is the most prestigious university in all of Georgia, and we applaud that. And you are the elite uh, university students in, in, in Georgia, so we would very much appreciate uh, hearing from you or, or trying to respond to your questions. But once again, we're very, very pleased to be here, so thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Professor said, tremendous speaker. So please, if you have any questions, raise your hand. Ask your question through the microphone here. I think we're going to have a lot of questions. <laughs> so uh, I have a question. So you mentioned China and China's uh, increasing strength as in politics and in the economy. I want to know your opinion about uh, their brokership of the deal in Yemen when uh, they basically mediated the war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, the war that is going on for decades. Like, uh, what is your opinion about that war and how is it going to affect U.S. interests in the region? Well, I think that uh, there, among the big geopolitical shifts that's going on is a kind of gradual withdrawal of the United States from the Middle East. Uh, this is the product of several different things. So. The United States fought two big wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and neither of them was a success. Afghanistan collapsed. The Western project in Afghanistan collapsed uh, in Biden's first year, uh, and Iraq is still a big mess. We just passed the 20th anniversary of the invasion, and Iraq is not a happy place uh, at the moment. But the other thing that's gone on is this um, shale revolution in, uh, in the United States, where the United States has gone from being an oil importer uh, back at the time of the oil crisis to being a major exporter. So I think we export what our total uh, output is something like 11 million barrels a day, and we export two or three million of those. 
Uh, and so the whole importance of the Persian Gulf that was one of the big drivers of American interest in that whole region has disappeared. And I think a lot of Americans would say to themselves, you know, good riddance. I'm glad we don't have to worry about all these Persian Gulf uh, uh, monarchies because they're simply not that important as a source of our own security and, and economic well-being. Uh, and I think that, um, so the combination of this weariness with involvement in a region that we really didn't understand very well, didn't do a very good job at stabilizing, plus this uh, lack of economic motive has led the Americans to retreat. Uh, we could criticize Saudi Arabia for human rights violations, you know, not worrying that they would get mad and, and you know, not sell us oil, this sort of thing. And the Chinese have walked into that, you know, opening that was given to them. And, um, you know, we uh, were supporting Saudi Arabia in this war against the Houthis in, in Yemen, uh, which the Saudis had persuaded us was part of a global struggle against international Shiism that was backed by Iran. I think this was a fundamental misunderstanding of what was really going on in that uh, conflict, but we didn't seem to be able to get out of it, and the Saudis couldn't get out of it either. And so I uh, imagine that they're quite happy that the Chinese have, you know, emerged as a broker in a way that the United States couldn't because it was much too tied up with, you know, the Saudi side of the conflict. And they, you know, have, uh, at least for the time being, brought these two countries together. Now, should we worry about this? Uh, a lot of Americans would say this is a terrible sign of American decline, and uh, it shows how China is displacing American influence. I'm not entirely sure that that's the right judgment of this, because, you know, when the United States was the dominant single global superpower, we didn't do such a great job, especially in this part of the world. Uh, and if the Chinese can, you know, bring about an end to that particular conflict, I would say, you know, that's probably a good thing uh, overall. Okay. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just add that uh, let's see how it plays out. There's long historical enmity between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, and I'm not sure one successful broker deal is uh, going to sustain that uh, uh, period of peace. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Next question, please. Uh, my question is really simple. What do you think? What is the future of Russian Federation after the war? Well, and no, like, uh, nobody, can, nobody can answer that question because, um, I mean, just the first issue is what's going to happen in the war itself. All right. Uh, if Ukraine wins, like, what do you think? I'm interested well, in your expert opinion. Okay, so I can I, I absolutely cannot tell you what's going to happen inside Russia. It, you know, is Putin going to survive a Ukrainian victory? I don't know. You know, I don't think anybody knows and I don't think anybody can speculate usefully. So I can give you my uh, predictions about what's going to happen in the war and then you can draw your own conclusions about what this would mean for Russia. Uh, so, you know, we've gone through since February 24th of last year, we've gone through several repeated cycles where the Russians attack, the Ukrainians do much better than anyone expects in defending themselves and then push the Russians back. So this happened last summer. Uh, they cleared the Russians out of the area. You know, they tried to take Kiev. They didn't succeed. They were pushed back. Then there appeared to be a stalemate in the Donbass uh, late summer, but then a new offensive started with the Ukrainians taking back Kharkiv and eventually reclaiming Kherson by November. And since that time, there's been an apparent stalemate where the Russians have poured an unbelievable amount of effort into taking this one city of Bakhmut. And there's been a lot of discussion whether the Ukrainian general staff was making a mistake because they also lost a terrible number of their own soldiers in the defense of this area. Uh, my personal opinion is that in the first place, the fact that Putin had to rely on the Wagner group to do the bulk of the fighting in the Donbass uh, this winter indicates what terrible shape the regular Russian military is in. Uh, and they've also lost a lot of people. And what the Ukrainians say is that they're doing exactly what they were doing in Severodonetsk and 
uh, Lysychansk and these other cities, you know, last summer, which is exhausting the Russians as a prelude to this counteroffensive that's going to, uh, it's going to take place, you know, hopefully next month, the month after that. Uh, and at that point, the Russians may be sufficiently weakened that, you know, what is going to be for any military a very difficult operation may succeed. And I think that really the hope for outcome that I could see emerging by the end of the summer is for Ukraine to take back uh, Kherson Oblast and, and Zaporizhia Oblast. Those are the two really important regions. It's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, Ukraine is not going to be economically viable if it doesn't reclaim access to the Black Sea and all of the ports that it had on the Sea of Azov. Uh, and secondly, if they take Kherson Oblast, they will cut off Crimea. They will cut the rail line that uh, goes from Rostov to uh, Crimean Peninsula. The Kerch Strait Bridge will come under artillery range, uh, you know, with the high marks. It was already bombed once. Uh, yeah. It can be bombed twice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they can, they'll be able to bomb it anytime they want. And then this freshwater canal that leaves from uh, Nova Kakova and supplies water to the Crimean Peninsula that they used to control will be back under their control. And, you know, quite frankly, taking back that territory is much more important than reclaiming the Donbass for them. Uh, and at that point, if they can do this by, let's say, August, then I think they will be in a reasonable position to force uh, Putin into some more realistic kind of ceasefire because they don't have to actually militarily occupy the Crimea to be able to squeeze it. They will be able to cut off all of the supply lines that go into Crimea. And the threat of losing Crimea through slow attrition, I think, is something that Putin is going to take very, very seriously. Uh, and that, you know, I think would so people keep saying, well, what's the end game in the war? What does it look like? It's not the Ukrainian army occupying Moscow, right? That's not going to happen. Well, uh, but it does seem to me something like the scenario I just outlined is entirely possible. Uh, not only is it possible, it's necessary. Because if the Ukrainians do not break out of the current uh, lines that they're, they've been in for the last six months, then I'm afraid that Western support is going to start to decline. You can see that already. The Republicans in Congress, with every aid vote, more and more of them have been voting against further military assistance to Ukraine. Um, if Donald Trump, well, Donald Trump will be the Republican candidate. He's on the wrong side. He's on the Russian side. And his supporters, yeah. Well, he's become like a Russian agent inside American politics. And so uh, it's going to become an issue in the presidential campaign, you know, in the United States. And if the United States uh, stops supporting Ukraine as strongly as it has been, the Europeans aren't, aren't going to be able to pick up the slack. So it is really, really important that this offensive succeed. And if it does, I can see a way forward to something, it won't be a peace settlement, but it would be a more durable uh, kind of armistice or ceasefire. And I really hope that that happens. Uh, and I expect that the Ukrainians will be able to pull that off. And that's as far as I can speculate, because I have no idea what's going to happen, you know, to Putin after that. I mean, I, I don't think any of us knows. Thank you. The next question on the second and then to the side. Uh, thank you. Uh, in Georgia, where uh, the third president uh, and one of the high-ranking uh, media owner uh, is imprisoned, uh, do you consider them as uh, political prisoners? And does this fact affect uh, about European integration? Thank you very much. Well, you know, um, Nino Efinidze and I wrote an article in Foreign Affairs about this uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it seems to me, or it seemed to us, that really the intention of, uh, you know, the way they're treating Saakashvili and, and, uh, uh, and the, the journalist are really intended to derail uh, European accession because the current government doesn't want to be part of Europe. And the Europeans, you know, are going to, you know, they're hoping the Europeans will react to this by freezing the accession process. 
And so what I think is important for you, uh, for Georgia's external supporters is not to punish Georgia as a whole uh, for this kind of action of a government that is not uh, representative of what really most Georgians want, which is the European rather than a Russian uh, future. And therefore, you know, the, this, the kind of pressure that needs to be put on the current government is not stopping that uh, accession process. It's really a targeted sanction against you know, the people that are pushing uh, for this, in particular, you know, one one individual that, you know, is, is above all responsible. Uh, whether, whether people in Washington or Brussels will interpret things this way, I don't know, uh, but I really hope so. And that's part of the reason that we were advocating for a very carefully targeted sanctions, because it'll be very easy to say, oh, Georgia, the rule of law has collapsed, and therefore everything is off and Georgia has no future in Europe. That would be a very bad outcome of, you know, the current situation. Thank you. From this side, please, Aketro. Uh, hello, Mr. Fukuyama. Uh, thank you for uh, your visit. And uh, my question is, um, while it is true that uh, most of the newer generations are very much in favor of the liberal democracy and its progress, uh, the reality is that a lot of people are are not necessarily so amicable. They don't trust it. And the thing is, we can't exclude these people from our society. You know, if we were to stick to our principles, they're also valuable members of society. So my question is, how do we get these people to at least engage in constructive dialogue and maybe not agree with us, but at least be constructive? Yeah, well, that's a question that we Americans uh, face ourselves. Uh, I think that you know, you, first of all, you have to understand the social basis of the current polarization that's going on in the world and why you get these populist politicians uh, arising in, you know, many different uh, countries. There's a strong correlation that uh, uh, exists with population density, of all things, uh, that most people that vote for liberal uh, parties and politicians live in urban areas uh, with concentrated populations, with large numbers of well-educated people, with a lot of professionals, and people that vote for populist parties tend to live in smaller towns and villages in the countryside. Uh, they tend to be older, uh, and this is true almost everywhere. It's true in the United States, it's true in Britain, it's true in Russia, it's true in Turkey, it's true in Hungary, you know, many places that have experienced this kind of uh, you know, populist nationalism, and it reflects a cultural and an economic uh, split within the society because with uh, the advance of globalization, with more technology being the source of wealth in the modern economy, the returns to education and, you know, high skill levels has increased, and that's increased the economic uh, division between social classes. And it also corresponds to a big cultural division between people that, you know, are more tolerant of diverse lifestyles and people that uh, are um, uh, want to live in a, you know, a, in an older established uh, cultural tradition. Uh, so everybody, I would say, in this room is part of the, you know, the urban professional, well-educated group. And I do think that it's important for people in that situation to understand that they have their own prejudices and their own failings when it comes to thinking about that other group of people. There's a tendency to think that they're just uneducated, stupid. They don't understand, you know, the way the world works. They're prejudiced. They're racist. You know, uh, they're religious bigots, one thing or another. And it becomes very easy then to write off their concerns as not being very serious. So I think the first thing that you need to do is to understand that a lot of the populist pressure uh, is the result of a, um, you know, an honest uh, resentment of the kind of disrespect that educated elites show to people that are not like themselves, right? So that's just a beginning point. Many of the complaints that they have uh, are not the 
result of prejudice or ignorance. You know, they reflect uh, limited economic opportunities. It reflects, you know, unhappiness about the speed of cultural change that is taking place. And I think that it's important to, you know, see that and, and to, you know, figure out ways of reaching. But the first thing you've got to do is listen, right? You've got to listen very carefully to what people are saying and kind of take it seriously. But I don't know if either of my colleagues want to add to that. We have a project at Stanford called the Deliberative Democracy Project, which actually uh, twins people from differing uh, political views, puts them in a hotel for a weekend to talk about their, their differences and their similarities. And uh, I'm not intimate with the results of that project, but uh, generally uh, the project has found that uh, people can reach uh, understanding, but it takes time and, and uh, a concerted effort. It's, it's, uh, uh, anthropologists have been writing about this since time out of mind that, that we prefer to travel with our own tribe. And uh, trying to break out of that, and we even in an urban, urbane context, travel with our own tribes. To try to break out of that intentionally, to have conversations with those who disagree with you, I think is an ongoing project that merits attention. Uh, Thank you. The, the a... student was interrupted, so give the microphone yeah. to him. Now I have a microphone, and hopefully you can hear. Uh, so I'm a student of international relations who is interested in great power politics. So naturally, my question goes to Professor Fukuyama. Uh, professor, in your recent article for Foreign Affairs, you praise Georgian youthist work protesting against a uh, foreign agents bill with Georgian dream tried to pass. My question is the following. As one of the most influential Western thinkers, what would you recommend us, young Georgians, young scholars, to write about and to do practically to help Georgia strengthen its role within the Western world. Well, you have to protect democracy in Georgia and the rule of law in Georgia, you know, as a first uh, issue. So how do you do that? Uh, you know, the way that it works is you have to have political power. Uh, and that means that, you know, people that have your agenda of protecting democracy have to win elections. That's what it boils down to in a society that still has elections. And you, you know, you're, you're, not, you're not Russia at this point where elections really don't mean anything. They, they can mean that. And the problem, you know, in Georgia, as I, uh, as I have come to understand it, is that any kind of opposition to the current uh, government has been very fractured, uh, very weak. Uh, it is a almost universal rule that more liberal uh, parties don't work with each other very well. This is true in Turkey, it's true in Hungary, uh, you know, it's true in many uh, countries around the world, and in places where they actually have been able to form coalitions uh, and broaden uh, their base of power, they have been able to win elections. And so I would say that, you know, as young people, you have to engage in a political process. Uh, you can't say, well, politics is a dirty business, and it has nothing to do with me. Uh, it has a lot to do with you. Uh, and therefore, you know, this is not a recommendation to sign up with any particular political party, but you need to be aware that if you don't get to exercise political power, you'll never stop the deterioration of your institutions. And I'd say the same thing to young people in, in the United States. You know, uh, if you allow Donald Trump to become president again in 2024, then it's your own fault that you, you're going to get the kind of country you deserve. And so you've got to go out and vote, you've got to mobilize, you've got to, you know, uh, and a lot of my students have actually done that. I mean, they've decided, you know, in the 1990s, most of my students were politically very unengaged. You know, they just wanted to make their careers and get on in life, have families and so forth. But with the rise of populism in the United States, a lot of them have now decided to go into politics and run for office. And so several of my students, I'm proud to say, are actually holding elective office, you know, mostly at a local level. Uh, but I'm expecting great things of them. And I would say that that's something, you know, that needs to happen uh, here as well. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next question. Hello. Um, uh, if we if we take a uh, if we take a best scenario and where Donald Trump becomes the president of the United States in 2024 and uh, Russia win against the Ukraine uh, and also the China's gaining power day to day. Um, is there, what do you think? Is there any chance that this will be uh, the beginning of the end of the liberal democracy spreading <laughs> all over the world? What will be the new world order in your imagination? It'll be bad. You know, there's no, um, there's no denying that. I mean, if those events a Trump victory, a Russian victory, and Chinese dominance, you know, the world is going to look very, very bad. But I don't think that that's inevitable. Uh, you know, at any given point in history, human beings have agency over what their future looks like. That is to say, they're not these big forces that necessarily push history in one direction or another. It really depends on whether people are willing to stand up and fight for, you know, the values that they believe in. One of the encouraging things to come out of the Ukraine war is actually the new solidarity that exists in NATO. Uh, you know, I think very few of us actually thought that Ukraine would receive the degree of support that it has because, you know, Germany and France were really eager to negotiate and they wanted to keep Russia within a European security system. And I think after the invasion, everybody realized that this was just a, an illusion and, you know, something that couldn't happen. Uh, and so NATO has actually grown stronger. We just gained a new member, you know, Finland, and hopefully Sweden will join uh, as well. So it's possible to fight back. And I think it's important not to get overly pessimistic about the future of democracy, because in the end, you know, because democracy does depend on the voluntary support of people uh, that, uh, you know, that's, a, that's an enduring strength. The other thing to keep in mind is that authoritarian decision-making is really, really bad. Not, not, I mean, it's bad in the sense of being evil, but it's also just bad decision-making. So Putin, if you remember, uh, couldn't even meet with his defense minister or his foreign minister without sitting at the end of a 30-foot table because he was so afraid of COVID, right? And uh, he didn't talk to anybody, as far as we can tell, about uh, his decision to invade Ukraine. He certainly didn't understand anything about what Ukraine was, uh, what Ukrainians thought. He had no idea how bad his own army was, right? And he therefore made one of the biggest mistakes that any world leader has made in my lifetime. Xi Jinping was similarly, I think, isolated. Uh, when he went in for his zero COVID policy, which was a crazy policy that was extremely costly to that uh, country and was only stopped when, you know, millions of Chinese came out and protested and said they couldn't take it anymore. So, it, you know, you have to remember that there's a certain reason why we prefer living in a liberal democracy. You know, we believe that actually power that is absolute and concentrated really tends to get corrupted and, and tends to be misused, and that's why we put constraints around power. And you shouldn't forget that, you know, that that's an advantage that we've got. Uh, and so don't give up. <laughs> Hello, um, uh, Mr. Fukuyama, I want to ask you, um, there are some uh, scholars, mostly the realist scholars, for example, John Mishaimer or uh, other ones, who think that uh, the liberal order in international relations is over today because it was relevant during the unipolar system, but today, when it's a multipolar uh, great power system, it's uh, not relevant anymore. And also, uh, he says that the uh, uh, war in Ukraine is caused by United States and NATO's activities and their Eastern enlargement policy. And uh, what do you think about these ideas and what's wrong about it? And uh, uh, what is, what's, what's your uh, opinion about this? <laughs> yeah, don't get me started about John Mearsheimer. So <laughs> John is an old friend of mine. I've known him ever since graduate school. And I used to think that he was wrong every other thing that said came out of his mouth. But... Ever since uh, this war began, I think everything that's come out of his mouth is wrong. Uh, and, you know, it, it, but it's, it's something that deserves serious uh, consideration. So what he calls realism is basically kind of old-fashioned 19th century colonial politics, right? He 
thinks that if you're a great power, that somehow entitles you to buffer zones and you know, neutral areas and a sphere of influence. And nobody thinks like that anymore. You know, since 1945, uh, he may have noticed that the world decolonized, you know, that people don't grab other people's territory when they don't want to be grabbed. Uh, and so he and Putin are still living in this 19th century world, you know, of great power politics. But the more serious problem is that it's completely theoretical and doesn't actually, he's not listening to, to what Putin himself is saying, right? So Putin wrote that long 5,000 word article in the summer of uh, 2021, and then he gave a very long speech on February 21st, uh, three days before the invasion, in which he made pretty clear what his objectives were. It was not about NATO expansion. It was about the Russians and Ukrainians are one people that the division of Russia and Ukraine, he blames it on Lenin, uh, and he says that that was a great historical mistake and a great injustice, and that he, you know, his purpose is to fix that mistake. And that doesn't have anything to do with NATO. Uh, it is true that he felt threatened, not by uh, a security threat that NATO posed to him, because that was non-existent. He feels threatened by democracy. He, he felt threatened by the democratic upsurge that occurred both during the uh, uh, 2004 Orange Revolution and then during the Maidan uprising in 2013-14 because he saw that there was a Slavic country right next door that shared a history with Russia that could be democratic. And that was a nightmare in his view because the Russian people might at some point decide that they wanted to do what the Ukrainian people did. And that was that was the political threat that he felt. Uh, so that to the extent that he acted defensively, it was to prevent you know, those democratic ideas from seeping into uh, Russia itself, but it had nothing to do with security. And the solution to that is not uh, some you know, satisfying of uh, a presumed security fear that Russia has. It is by basically defeating Russia. That's the only, you know, solution to that particular problem. Thank you. Um, girls are here, so please give the microphone here. Aya Ketra. First of all, hello. Um, I'm a student of international relations, and uh, my question relates to Georgia. So um, Georgia, one of the greatest problems in Georgia is probably polarization, political polarization, which pits people against each other and spreads hatred in the society. So my question is, um, how can we eradicate this problem in Georgia? How can we depolarize Georgia? Uh, because you know, people here, the most important and critical problem now is that people are fighting against each other because of mere political differences. So uh, my question is, how can we depolarize Georgia? And what is the role of us, the youth? And my question is a general question. It, everyone can answer it, so yeah. Well. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, you're, I don't think you're in a democracy. You're not going to completely, as you say, depolarize. You're going to have different points of view, different ideology, and you're going to have to learn to communicate with one another, as Professor Fukuyama said. I don't know that you're as polarized as you may think you are. Um, I, don't, I don't know that much about Georgia, but from what we hear, uh, eight, whether you believe it's 80% or 90%, uh, of Georgians um, are not particularly in favor of this government. That's what I hear. I don't know if it's true. If it's eighty percent or ninety percent, that's not polarization. I mean, uh, there's only a minority that is in favor. And I don't quite understand it, frankly. Uh, it's hard for me to get my mind around a country where eighty or ninety percent are against the government, and yet the government controls everything. Uh, but the point is that you're always going to have some degree of polarization, which is another way of saying differences of opinion. Uh, and uh, as was set up before, you've got to learn how to reach out, understand what the other side is thinking, why they're thinking, and how you can find middle ground. That's all I can say. There's no quick fix or easy way to get around this. But um, you will never get rid of polarization completely. So you have to be more tolerant. Uh, and I think that that will happen. Social media has not been kind to civility and in, in discourse. Um, I've 
I am off of social media, uh, but I am exposed to it regularly, and I can't believe the, the, the vile and the uh, offensive language that is used uh, among people that has become a matter of habit on, on social media. So there are some factors here that are really exacerbating a, a, a pre-existing historic problem with, with uh, political polarization. Uh, thanks all for coming. So I wanted to ask Mr. Stoner, right, uh, about uh, so how did uh, China's authoritarianism and uh, its uh, economic growth challenge the idea that democracy is a necessary condition for um, economic growth in general? I listened to Ray Dalio, the uh, investor, American investor, if you, if you heard of him. So he says a lot about these uh, things that democracy modern in modern times is not necessarily the best way to uh, grow economically. So for all the human beings to to live better, right? Uh, so that's my question. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think anybody argued that democracy is the optimal uh, political system if your single objective is economic growth. Uh, that's obviously not true. Uh, you have South Korea, Taiwan that went through these high growth periods when they were ruled by military authoritarian governments. You have China that, as Roger was saying, was one of the biggest growth miracles of the 20th and 21st centuries, and it's never been democratic. So nobody, I don't think, has ever argued that democracy is the optimal system if all you want is economic growth. Uh, however, there is a correlation between uh, high income and democracy. Uh, this was an idea that was, you know, really articulated in modernization theory that uh, you could grow very rapidly as an authoritarian country, but once you actually hit a certain level of income, it meant that your population was much more educated, that it was urban as opposed to rural, and with that education and higher standards of living, people's values begin to change, and they don't simply want security and food on the table. They want political participation. They want to be able to think for themselves. They want more opportunities for their children, and therefore there's going to be increasing uh, pressure to liberalize an authoritarian political system. So this is exactly what happened in quite a number of countries, right? In South Korea, Taiwan, Chile, you know, these countries all grew very rapidly under authoritarian dictatorships, uh, but then at a certain point they democratized, and that's what people were expecting with China, uh, that when China reached middle income status and you had a big middle class in China that they would also follow the path that the South Koreans and the Taiwanese and Japan had taken and they would start demanding more democracy. But China hasn't done that uh, and therefore now a lot of people think that the premise of modernization theory was wrong, that high income does not necessarily produce pressure for a, at least a more liberal kind of uh, order. I'm not completely convinced that that theory is, is, is now just completely disproven because there are a lot of factors that, you know, that, that lead to pressures for democracy and you know, there are other factors that could have overwhelmed you know, this correlation between high income and desire for a more liberal order and China may still you know, succumb to that. Uh, but I think that's really the, the sort of conceptual model that was being debated and, you know, is still being argued about. So, so just when I was talking about China before and this 40 year period of what was, we call the economic miracle, there was no democracy, but there was an openness uh, and there was a thriving private sector and there was a market economy and those things, even without democracy. And I, I saw this firsthand over and over, and over again, there was a, uh, what started out as no private sector, no private property, no stock market, uh, everything controlled by the state when you go back to the late 70s, early 80s, to a thriving market economy for a very, very long time. That is now somewhat under threat. But during that period, 
where uh, it was flourishing and growing very, very rapidly. China was not democratic, and yet the private sector was, was booming. And entrepreneurs were coming out from every, every which way, and they, they built this country uh, and this economy. I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen next, uh, because the country has become much, much more authoritarian, much more, at least from what we can see, anti-free open markets. But the jury is still out, and I don't think we know what's going to happen in China. And uh, uh, I suspect that what they're doing right now is not going to work very effectively, in this, and the pendulum is probably going to start to swing back the other way, but I, I don't want to predict anything. But I think that uh, Frank is right that you can't necessarily correlate democracy with market economies. So I'll just add my voice to the chorus. There isn't an in inevitability of high economic growth with democracy, as, as Frank points out. But the, um, uh, all of the high-income countries in the world today are democracies except those that have a lot of oil, are tax havens or casinos. I mean, uh, so uh, I, I'm not seeing a, a really strong uh, counter-argument as we sit here today. Thank you. These guys asking for a long time and then here for girls. Uh, hello, uh, I am Ilya Kardawa, University of uh, Georgia. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for coming and for uh, this opportunity. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, Russia and uh, Georgia. Uh, you know that uh, today Georgian territory is 20 percent is occupied by Russia, and uh, also uh, 2008 was uh, terrible years for us. Uh, and uh, uh, Georgia was uh, first uh, uh, against Putin's ag aggressions, and uh, uh, in uh, 2008. Uh, uh, was uh, their uh, international uh, support uh, for Georgia that uh, Ukraine uh, has uh, today? I see. Okay. So, well, look, I mean, I think your question answers itself. I think, uh, you know, Putin did this aggression and nothing happened. You know, there are no sanctions and no military response of any sort. And so he figured he could go then take Crimea and the Donbass, and he did that. And there wasn't very much uh, uh, Western reaction. And so by the time you get to 2022, he figures he can take the whole of Ukraine and the West isn't going to do very much. And I think pretty clearly that was a failure of deterrence, uh, that he really did not fear any big consequences uh, from doing what he did. Uh, and that was a huge mistake on the part of you know, the... Western supporters of Georgia, Ukraine, and everybody else in the region. And uh, I don't want that to happen with Taiwan. You know, I don't want the Chinese to think that they can grab Taiwan with no consequences to themselves uh, because, you know, I think that would be their calculus if they felt that uh, that country was not going to get any support from, uh, from the outside. Thank you. Next question here. Mike. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hello. First of all, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure uh, listening to you. Uh, I'm also a student of international relations. And my question is, in 2022, uh, there were a lot of conversations about Euro integration. And Georgia has been on the road of inter Euro integration for many, many years. In 2022, we did apply for candidate status, but we weren't granted one. But in 2022, for example, Bosnia did. And it's a country that has low levels of democracy, economic imbalances. And I'm not saying that Georgia is perfect in all of those senses, but for example, the um, uh, attitudes towards the youth, uh, of the youth towards Euro integration is way higher in Georgia, for example, statistically. And my question is, do you think European Union is strictly geopolitical or do you think it's about values. I want to hear all of your opinions, if it's possible. Well, I don't think it's all about values. I think it's about domestic politics in Europe. I mean, if you look at this from the standpoint of the older members of the European Union, they let in a lot of countries that they shouldn't have let in in the first place, especially Hungary, right? And the European Union has no way of disciplining members that then backslide. Hungary is no longer a liberal democracy. It, it has no business being a member of the European Union, and they're, they're stuck with it. Uh, and you have similar problems in Bulgaria, Romania. I mean, there have been big corruption problems uh, and poor governance in you know, a lot of places like that. And so I think from the standpoint of a 
you know, a France or a Germany looking at the candidate. And by the way, <laughs> George is not the only country that's been disappointed. You know, North Macedonia changed its name so that they could get rid of a European objection to their membership. Uh, and, you know, Montenegro, I mean, a lot of those countries have been waiting a really long time uh, to get in. And I think the, the problem is the same, uh, you know, for, for everyone, that the older countries just got, feel they got burned by expanding the EU too quickly uh, and taking in countries that weren't really ready for it. And I think you'd have to say that if Georgia has, you know, this polarized politics where you get one government that's pro-Western and then they're led into the EU and then all of a sudden there's another election and the Georgian dream or some equivalent populist party comes to power and starts dismantling uh, Georgian democracy, then you're going to have the same problem that they're having now with Hungary. So I just think that that's fundamentally the, the, the constraint that is keeping uh, Europe from, you know, accepting everybody. So I would just say you, you should keep trying and then eventually you're going to get into the <laughs> EU. Oh. So the last question, because there's no time. So he came down from upstairs, downstairs. So let's give him the <laughs> good shit. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming again. We are very pleased to be here. As you can see, a lot of people are interested in hearing you. Uh, sadly, I have to choose uh, only one question, and I've never had an opportunity to, to ask American professors about this. So I, lo uh, I know that uh, you Americans love your constitution. Uh, I, <laughs> I wish some parts of our country. Yeah, uh, I wish that uh, that quality would uh, we sh we would share uh, in Georgia, but. Um, I would ask a question about the Second Amendment. How do you see as a feature of Second Amendment in America? Well, it's not, <laughs> it's going to be there forever. I mean, uh, Americans love guns. I mean, there's, you know, there's a really deep cultural trend uh, that was brought over from uh, England back before the United States was a country that uh, really is a gun culture. Uh, what's really scary to me is that, you know, I would say 20, 30 years ago, the Second Amendment types that really wanted to protect gun ownership uh, would argue in favor of it on the grounds that they were hunters or they lived in rural areas or, you know, they liked target practice uh, and that sort of thing. And that argument has shifted. And so now a substantial number of Americans say we need guns in order to defend ourselves from Joe Biden or some, you know, left-wing politician. And that's a very dangerous situation. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. But unfortunately, that's the way that politics on the right has kind of evolved, where there's this extreme distrust and paranoia about the government. And that's why people want to arm themselves. And that's not a formula for stability, really. So as this group looks for reasons to be optimistic about Georgia, you can be optimistic that, you know, you don't have a right to bear arms in your constitution. Uh, and in fact, very, very few uh, countries in the world have the right to bear arms in their constitution. Uh, Mexico recently rescinded that, that right. Uh, star countries like uh, Guatemala and I believe Haiti have a constitutional right to, uh, to bear arms, but, you know, Georgia doesn't, so that's good. Uh, back in the 1970s, there was a, a Time cover story. I'll just get into a little comparative constitutional law since you mentioned the C word, that is constitutions. Uh, back in the 1970s, there was a, a cover uh, article in Time magazine about the U.S. Constitution and it, how it was our gift to the world. Well, it hasn't worked out that way. Uh, the uh, U.S. Constitution was a model of constitution drafting uh, decades ago. Uh, but believe it or not, uh, the Canadian Constitution is now the one that's uh, most often fo followed around the world. I would just add to this that I, uh, I come from a part of America where hunting is almost religious. Uh, all my neighbors have guns. Um, in, in, the, in September and October during the deer hunting season, nobody goes to work. Uh, they're all out in the woods hunting. So there is a culture in the United States 
at least where I come from, where I live, uh, where hunting is sacred uh, and very rare. But this is not about hunting. And, and I think that it's, it's gone so much beyond that. I don't think you're going to get rid of the Second Amendment, but we must do something about, uh, about the proliferation uh, of guns in this country. And my, all my neighbors who go hunting, they don't have an AK-47. Uh, it, it's not so much that people have guns. It's that it's just proliferated and become so abused that we have a, we have a huge crisis in our country uh, with the gun culture. But it's not, I, I wouldn't, it's a, it gets back to what we were talking about earlier about polarization and learning to talk to the people on the other side. And I talk to lots of hunters. I don't have a gun, by the way. I don't hunt, but a lot of my friends do, and so we have to uh, we have to reach a middle ground here. But it doesn't that middle ground does not include AK forty seven. So we we have a lot of work to do in our country. Uh, since we're going to end this, I just want to say how impressed I am by all of you. Uh, I was thinking if this forum was being held in a, in a university in the United States, uh, we'd be lucky if any of the students could say a few words in a foreign language. Uh, and yet the, 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 qual the quality of English is, is, is one metric uh, uh, of your competence is any indication. I mean, I'm overwhelmingly impressed by how well you speak, how well informed you are, and uh, you should be very proud of what you're doing here. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you, the dear guests. Professors, supporters of Georgia, I thank you for everything that you are doing for Georgian society. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.